So we begin with imaging of the central nervous system. Now there are relative advantages of MRI over CT and they range from minimal to substantial. Now the choice of the imaging should be, you know, it depends on the severity of the symptoms, the urgency and probability of underlying disease vary and a part of vagaries of medicine. CT, uh, the cost is definitely lesser and CT is quick, reasonable diagnostic quality and can be used in uncooperative patients. Now, uh, stroke is one of the most common indications while, uh, while neuroimaging is done. While imaging, you need to know that, you know, the goal is rapid and accurate assessment of the cause. You might need to know why the stroke has happened. Is it because of an embolic episode? Is it because of an aneurysm? Is it because of a tumor? And separate patients with hemorrhage and other non-ischemic causes. Since TPA or the recombinant tissue plasminogen activator is effective in treatment for infarct in absence of hemorrhage provided administered within three hours of onset. So what is the role of CT in stroke? It rules out hemorrhage, rapid, uh, it's uh, quite fast and may take only 4.75 seconds. It's widely available, low cost and can now perform perfusion studies. What are the drawbacks of CT? It will not detect an infarct in less than three hours. Limited potential for brainstem, cerebellum, and small infarcts deep within the cerebellar. Or uh, sorry, what is the role of CT? It helps and rules out uh, uh, rule out hemorrhage. It's quite fast. It's widely available, low in cost, and can now perform perfusion studies. Drawbacks: these include uh, that you know CT cannot pick up a stroke which is you know less than three to four hours for which diffusion is extreme diffusion weighted image imaging is extremely sensitive so limited potential for brainstem cerebellum and uh, small infarcts deep within the cerebral hemispheres so what are the advantages of MR diffusion uh, weighted imaging is extremely sensitive and can pick up strokes within 30 minutes uh, perfusion studies will tell you what is the uh, area of the penumbra the penumbra is one region around the infarcted uh, tissue, you know, which is potentially salvageable. So in case you give RTPA, you know, that uh, tissue can be salvaged. Lacuna lesions in deep cerebral hemisphere, brainstem and cerebellum are easily picked up. So what is the uh, uh, drawbacks? They are basically the time factor, uh, may be difficult to monitor patient in the MR suite and the cost. Uh, what happens is in strokes, certain patients they become you know disoriented they might become rowdy and they might not uh, comply and they keep on moving hence uh, you know MR would be extremely difficult in such patients so let me tell you this was a patient which had present to, presented to us within two hours of the stroke so this was a CT which was done which is unremarkable or normal and this is one this is a diffusion weighted imaging of the same patient which actually shows areas of restricted diffusion in the left frontoparietal white uh, left frontoparietal cortex so which was actually su suggestive of an acute non hemorrhagic infarct another patient which had presented with a thalamic bleed so this is a d1 weighted image showing the uh, showing the bleed within the left thalamus this is a flare image uh, and this is a gre image and uh, this shows the bleed very well so one advantage of GRE or the gradient images, it's excellent in picking up small quantities of blood or even calcium. However, it is extremely diff difficult to differentiate between calcium and blood on MR. So another sequence that we uh, use at times if you're suspecting a venous uh, infarct or you know you want to rule out a thrombus within the venous sinuses, this is known as MR venography. Now this study may be done with or without the use of uh, intravenous contrast. So over here in this patient, what we are seeing is the superior sagittal sinus, the transverse sinuses, the sigmoid uh, sinuses and the IJVs. So this is how it is. Talking about aneurysms and arteriovenous malformations. Aneurysms may present with subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, arteriovenous malformations with parenchymal bleed and or subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, if CT if uh, CT is the modality of choice if the presentation is with the bleed. CT angiography is good to identify aneurysms in presence of a bleed. MR is good to identify arteriovenous malformations in presence of bleed. 
So in subarachnoid hemorrhage, CT may be performed before uh, lumbar puncture and then uh, one may directly go in for an angiography. Now this, these are two cases, you know, uh, where, uh, you know, this is the normal, uh, this is the normal parenchyma and over here you see a lot of flow voids and a lot of, you know, uh, gradient over here, uh, blooming over here. So this is basically our arterial uh, uh, AV malformation. So uh, this is over here, you see a lot of vessels over here. This is your MR angiography and this is how an MR angiography will help you evaluate the uh, evaluate the uh, arterial venous malformation. The next step obviously after this would be a DSA, a digital subtraction angiography which will you know uh, uh, which will need embolization to take care of the arterial venous malformation. Now these images what I'm showing you over here these are basically MR angiography images which obviously they do not require any injection of contrast. So these are beautiful images that you can see over here of the vertebral arteries this is your basilar artery, your ICA, your MCA, and these are anterior cerebral arteries. This was one patient where, you know, over here, when we performed the MR angiography through the neck vessels, we saw a small aneurysm uh, through here, but it was a non-thrombosed aneurysm. So that's, uh, you know, it shows us that it's a fusiform aneurysm. Again, like I said, the next choice after you pick up a lesion, digital subtraction angiography is the uh, modality of choice for evaluation of arterial venous malformations. Coming to brain tumors, calcification is best seen on CT. MRI with contrast is a modality of choice. Now there are a lot of advanced MR imaging methods for evaluation of the tumors which would include your MR spectroscopy, MR perfusion and diffuse uh, uh, and diffusion tensor imaging. So MR spectroscopy will tell you about the metabolites within the uh, mass uh, mass within the brain whether it has high uh, lipids or lactate or alanine or MR perfusion will tell you whether uh, what is the blood supply to the lesion is it a hyperperfused which has high vascular supply or is it hypoperfused uh, so this is a CT this is uh, uh, imaging which shows a, a, a neoglioma and the left uh, uh, frontal region this is how it looks and after giving contrast it enhances so much there's another uh, patient uh, over here uh, which, which shows a mass in the right uh, parit uh, right parietal region and so on MRI again you know this is a, another glio a patient with glioblastoma multiform this is a lesion uh, over here in the left uh, temporal lobe this is a coronal image and these are the post contrast images showing uh, a pattern of enhancement. This is a patient with meningioma. So meningiomas are known to be extraction lesions and over here it shows brilliant enhancement on the post contrast study. So apart from looking at the meningioma, we are not only interested in looking at the meningioma, we want to see what is happening to the surrounding structures. Is it encasing the left MCA, is it encasing the optic uh, optic nerve and the chiasma and or is it causing any uh, pressure changes like you know hydrocephalus so all this information would be required by the surgeon because this will uh, determine the next step for the treatment again this is a patient who had presented with uh, right sided uh, you know uh, right sided tinnitus what we see over here on CT initially this is widening of the internal auditory canal uh, compared to the left side and this is how it shows increased enhancement on the post contrast image and this is the MRI of the same patient and this is what it turned out to be a cerebellopontine angle schwannoma. Once again pituitary macroadenomas uh, MRI is a modality of choice uh, a, mic a pituitary microadenoma is less than 10 mm in size and a pituitary macroadenoma is more than 10 mm in size so uh, if you're suspecting a pituitary microadenoma you need to do a, dy a dynamic MRI of the pituitary gland with contrast so this is how it is now in acute cerebral trauma let me tell you CT is the modality of choice because CT is fast it is extremely good for evaluating calvarial injuries facial injuries osseous orbital injuries and uh, a neurosurgeon would like to see that because if there's a fracture it needs to be fixed. MR 
uh, will help in evaluating diffuse axonal injuries. Uh, now these diffuse axonal injuries are particular areas in brain which present as microbleeds. So over here, over here what you see is it's a fracture of the right parietal bone. Over here the, another patient showing you know an extraxial collection which is a hematoma. Similar cases over here is a actual uh, collection which is subdural hemorrhage. Same thing, another patient with subdural hemorrhage with a mass effect, there's a midline shift to the left side and there's dilatation of the lateral ventricle. White matter disorders. In white matter disorders, just like tumors, MRI is the modality of choice. So, uh, multiple sclerosis, this is typical, you know, uh, lesions perpendicular to the, uh, to the wall of the lateral ventricle, which are known as Dawson's fingers. Uh, Kernicteris, these are abnormalities in bilateral basal ganglia over here. This was a child with high bilirubin count on, uh, uh, on the third month uh, after birth. So this, uh, you have to know what are the causes of uh, abnormalities in bilateral basal ganglia. Lay's disease, another metabolic disorder. This is your typical abnormality T2 hyperintensity within the putamen. And this is how a a graph from the MR spectroscopy looks like, you know, uh, this is telling you exactly what are the various metabolites which might help you in determining what is the sort of disease process going on. This is your typical textbook, uh, tuberculous meningitis. Uh, when you do a CT, uh, CT will, uh, you know, a plain CT, uh, if you're suspecting tuberculous meningitis, it is used to see what is a meningitis doing to the brain. What are the complications? Is there hydrocephalus or is there an infarct or are there any granulomas? When you do a post-contrast CT or post-contrast MR, what you'll typically find is there's enhancement of the meninges at the, in the basal cisterns and uh, you might even find granulomas within the parenchyma. These granulomas may either be seen as ring enhancing lesions and they might even mimic tumors. This was a patient with a congenital heart disease and this was actually turned out to be a cerebral abscess. Again, uh, you know, this is an adult patient which I talked about typical ring enhancing lesions over here. This is a mixed type of pattern but then these ultimately turned out to be tuberculomas. Neurocystic sarcosis. An another granuloma which is frequently a cause of seizures or epilepsy within the patients. So when a patient with epilepsy comes to you, uh, the MRI should be the modality of choice because MRI will determine what are the causes of epilepsy. Either is it mesial temporal sclerosis, is it develop, uh, malformation of cortical development, is there any sort of infection, is there a tuberculoma, is there uh, uh, or is there neurocystic sarcosis and a host of other uh, lesions which might be responsible for the, uh, for the convulsions. This is another patient with herpes encephalitis. Uh, over here, this is a flare image so, and this is a gradient image. Uh, what I'm trying to say is look at the flare image. Typically, this is a T2 weighted image uh, with suppression of the CSF. That's why these white matter lesions stand out over here. It's e more easier to appreciate. And in herpes encephalitis, we take a gradient image because we want to rule out whether there's hemorrhage within the area, uh, within the involved area or not. Same patient, see this is a T2 weighted image. We can see the lesion, we can barely make it out whether you know that this area is abnormal. But once we give contrast, our level of confidence increases that this is actually the area involved. Of obviously after the after the MRI, the next thing to do would be a lumbar puncture. The same patient underwent a radionucleotide scan, and this area shows of uh, involved with herpes encephalitis, it shows uh, hypometabolism. So while evaluating uh, you know the brain there are certain imaging modalities which are preferred. So there's a stroke in which MRI is a modality of choice. MR angiography or venography may be performed. CT is good at identifying subarachnoid hemorrhage. Transient ischemic attacks, MRI to rule out an acute infarct. A carotid Doppler may be, looked, uh, may be performed to uh, rule out a carotid plaque. Arteriovenous malformations, again, like I said, CT angiography, MR angiography, a digital subtraction angiography may be done. Cerebral aneurysms, CT angiography followed by DSA. DSA uh, will be, you know, uh, help 
uh, will help in identifying the aneurysm and probably coiling uh, the aneurysm. Again, infection, uh, uh, neoplasms, MRI is the modality of choice. Infections, uh, a combination either CT or MRI and PET for problem solving. Trauma, CT is a modality of choice. White matter disorders and epilepsy, MRI is a modality of choice. When dementia is considered, MRI may be done. MRI, uh, then probably CT, if at all it is required and PET for problem solving issues. Hypoxic ischemic injury in pediatrics. Neonates, MRI may be performed, but ultrasound is extremely good uh, to detect uh, subependymal hemorrhage. Now, miscellaneous uh, topics which I would be covering would include, you know, your neck, head and neck uh, lesions. This is your typically your thyroid. Uh, uh, this is typically your thyroid gland. This is your right lobe. This is your left lobe, and this is your isthmus. And this is your trachea that the thyroid is overlapping. This uh, let me tell you for identifying and evaluation of thyroid nodules and the sub uh, the salivary glands. Ultrasound is a modality of choice. This is another patient with a large uh, multinodular goiter heterogeneous appearance. This is a CT section, uh, CT appearance. This is another patient with a pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid gland. This is an MRI appearance. This patient had a well-defined solid uh, appearing lesion within the ultrasound. CA uh, for head and neck malignancies like the oral cancer, the buccal mucosa, cancer of the buccal mucosa, and this is a supraglottic uh, cancer. CT is uh, definitely preferred over, you know, uh, ultrasound for local uh, evaluation so or local staging, paranasal sinuses, x-rays followed by the CT. MRI is rarely used unless uh, you're suspecting a malignancy uh, uh, or you want to see if there's any, any intracranial extension of any particular disease process. Again, for eyes, ultrasound is excellent for evaluating retinal detachment. Uh, the, uh, this is your retina and these are these exudates below the retina. This is uh, another patient with retinoblastoma. Uh, this is a lobulated lesion which is seen on ultrasound. So this takes care of your uh, evaluation. So uh, you know taking a recap when you're considering evaluating oral and other head and neck neoplasm. CT neck should be done for oral and buccal carcinoma. MRI may be done for carcinoma of the tongue. Barium studies are good for pharyngeal masses, larynx, CT, neck. MRI may be performed to look for cartilage involvement in CA larynx. Salivary glands, like I said, ultrasound is an excellent modality. CT is uh, performed for further characterization of the masses, thyroid disorders. Ultrasound is a modality of choice. And of course, like we've discussed before, radionucleotide studies will help you. Uh, in evaluating whether there's a uh, there is an ectopic tissue or not, or whether postoperative is there any residual tissue with this, which is there or not. Paranasal sinuses, X-rays used to be done initially, even they're not done today. But actually, CT is a modality of choice. Orbit ultrasound is excellent for evaluation of the eye globe. MRI is used for evaluation of the of the orbital soft tissue masses and the retroorbital uh, optic nerve. For temporomandibular joint, either your OPG or your MRI may be done. So with this, I conclude my talk and thank you very much.